because you know we we're we're the trajectory that the United States is on right now as it relates to violence is not a good one. Um, but there are tools and there are solutions um, that can be implemented to help curve um, curve violence in in our country. Yeah, it definitely seems since COVID, um, there's been a uh, not only an uptick but like. CEO of Cure Violence Global, Dr. Eccles, joins No Politics today where he shares the approach of treating violence like a disease affecting society and using disease control methods to stop the spread of it. So let's do it. Too many days in the darkness without a glimpse of the light. Running tired and broken and scared But I swear I'll never give up the fight I see you broken and beat Head pulled down over your eyes Every part of you wants to surrender Darling, you were meant to survive With every smile Hi, Dr. Eccles. Thank you for uh, coming on today, you know, um, to, to, to get us started for our, our listeners who may be listening and hearing about, you know, Cure Violence Global for the first time. Do you mind illustrating really, you know, who the organization is and, of course, a little bit about yourself and what's been the, the driving factor for you to re uh, remain in this ever challenging field of combating violence? Because seeing, you know, the uptick in violence, I think, since COVID, especially, I think you guys, you know, got your work cut out for you. <laughs> right. Um, so good morning. Thanks for having me. Uh, so Cure Violence Global um, is an international organization that specializes in uh, helping jurisdictions implement a public health approach to uh, violence prevention. Uh, so we know for decades, a lot of the focus has been on um, the criminal legal system as it relates to violence prevention. And so a lot of funding and resources have gone to um, law enforcement agencies, public safety agencies, even legal entities. And we've seen the return on the investment. And so the challenge here is that, you know, a lot of the uh, efforts have really gone to put a Band-Aid on the solution versus ad addressing the root cause of the issue. And so what Cure Violence does is use a, an epi uh, epidemiology-based approach um, to uh, address um, violence prevention. And so what we do is um, we treat violence as a disease. And so we know that uh, individuals who are exposed to violence um, are more likely to commit acts of violence. And then when we look at um, uh, communities that are disproportionately impacted by violence, we see that um, there are certain conditions that kind of um, uh, have become pathognomonic for those communities. And so, um, for example, disinvestment, um, high levels of poverty, um, low education attainment, lack of access to medical and um, social support services. Uh, so those things really uh, put uh, communities and populations at a disadvantage and to the, to the point where individuals are fighting to survive every day. And so what we do is really work to address the root causes um, of, of violence. In public health, we often term it as determinants of health. Um, and so it's the same determinants of health that we see that impact individuals' um, chances for getting heart disease or other um, other communicable diseases are the same that we see for violence as well. And so um, by addressing the root cause of the um, uh, of violence um, and connecting individuals to those resources, we're able to do a couple of things. One, we're able to really have a sustainable impact. And so not just interrupting violence at that point in time, but also um, create changing the trajectory for those communities over the long term so that they can have better health outcomes. And we also, um, reduced issues related to intersectionality. So we know that, you know, based on previous practices, a lot of the efforts have really focused on targeting populations, right? And so, and what we've seen is that certain populations have essentially been um, uh, funneled to the criminal justice system. And so our, our, our work is really to undo the issues related to um, intersectionality and even systemic racism that has perpetuated a lot of the issues we see in violence um, uh, and, and violence prevention efforts today. Well, I um I love that it sounds like you guys are like the pro take the proactive approach. You know what I'm saying? Because I don't think any really social institution is is doing that right now. You know, I mean, um, you know, even um even with with, with police, they're more reactive. You know, a crime has to occur for them to stay um stay in business, really. You know, and there's I mean, there's a couple of um 
specific squads that, you know, try to go undercover and try to stop crimes from happening themselves. But from an overall approach, it's more of a reactive institution than, than it is proactive. And, you know, you, if the goal is to stop crimes, you do have to be proactive in, in some way. So it's, it's very relieving that that's kind of sounds like you guys, um, you guys are doing it and planning it. And I'm sure there's a lot of strategizing um, behind it. And I love, I love what you had um, discussed about treating it like a, like a disease, you know, because you're looking at it from like a scientific method approach where I was looking at your, um, the mission statement for the, the organization, which I just, loved it was the most simple sentence ever but to reduce violence globally using disease control and behavior change methods and sounds like you know it's from like a, a bird's eye view approach and you're treating violence as a disease where violence can be contagious you know it can be contagious Absolutely. where it can spread just like a disease and you know, like a disease, how it spreads. I mean, the very first thing I think of is retaliatory crimes, you know, retaliation. Mm -hmm. One thing happens, one person gets that disease, like HIV, one person gets it, they pass it on, pass it on, pass it on. And with retaliation crimes, especially in, in gangs and drugs, um, I feel like that's just that domino effect that just gets passed on. And, you know, like the Billy Joel song, we didn't start the fire, but guess what? The, the fire is still going uh, like an onslaught. So I thought that was um that was that that's an awesome approach to it, right? And I think you know that um, uh, the approach that we use is really three pronged. So the first is to, to to your point, you know, interrupting or stopping the violence. And so oftentimes that could be stopping stopping an act before it actually happens. And in some cases, the act has already happened, and so we're working to prevent retaliation from occurring. So we'll work with individuals who are uh, the victims and their networks. Um, to really get them to not to retaliate and commit um, uh, additional acts of crime. Uh, and then after that, so we also look at identifying uh, those individuals who are highest risk for committing acts of violence. So those are individuals who um, could be victims of, of, of violence, but we also have another population that really has gone unnoticed. So these individuals are individuals who are just struggling uh, to manage the day-to-day -day stresses of life. So as I mentioned before, in a lot of these communities that are disproportionately impacted by violence, what you'll see is people are fighting to survive. They're fighting to keep a roof over their head. They're fighting to put food on their table. They're fighting to uh, pay their bills. And so oftentimes they have difficulty uh, managing those stresses and they re may resort to those things that are most comfortable to, to them. So those things are those behaviors that they've been exposed to over time, which can include robbing individuals and committing other acts of violence. And so we also work through our case, ma case management efforts to connect those individuals to the, re to the resources that they need. So whenever we intake someone for for uh, case management, um, what we do is identify their true needs. And so, and also work with the local public health system, which includes not only the health department, but also academic institutions, social service organizations, medical systems, um, work with those entities to um, connect those, get those individuals connected to the resources that they need. So we change that trajectory, not only for that point in time, but over the long term. So they'll know how to, they know that these resources are available to them and they'll know how to access them. And then the third thing is changing social norms. So community engagement and education are critical to making sure that these programs are sustainable over time as well, and to make sure that they are effective and received well by the community. Because to go into a community um, where there's no community awareness, or there's no community support, um, is very unlikely that the program will survive. And so engaging the community in a way that works for them is really important. So we hire, we, are, we very intentionally uh, or we're very intentional about hiring individuals who are credible in those communities. And so oftentimes um, these individuals are uh, individuals who are justice involved. And so that's another thing that we have that we should probably talk about is, you know, what does it look like to support individuals who are justice involved who really want to do the work? You know, one of the things that have frustrated me over time is, you know, I've um, when I looked into different opportunities that were made available for individuals who um, uh, are justice involved. Um, the opportunities really weren't uh, good opportunities. So they would I consider to be token opportunities, right? So they would uh, not con not consider not not provide a livable wage. Um, they wouldn't have uh, employee benefits. Uh, they wouldn't have access to job skills trainings or other services that are needed for yeah. people to really um, live a decent quality of life. And so, changing that trajectory, you know, Cure Violence Global is really dedicated to making sure we provide the proper support 
folks who are reentering society who want to do good work and who are credible. And so we make sure they have a livable wage, give them full employee benefits, uh, as well as other access to other services that, that they need um, to live a good quality of life. Because the work that they're doing is also, it's not only is it non-traditional, but it's, it's very dangerous, right? And so having them go out into these uh, communities, engaging with individuals who were actively involved in um, whether it's organized efforts. Yeah, it's high or, risk. In, Right, absolutely. And so making sure they have access to those mental and behavioral support services is really critical as well, because not only do we need to address the trauma that those individuals experienced prior to being um, released uh, from um, uh, from jail or prison, but we also need to make sure they have access to, to those resources because they're responding to um, shootings, murders, and uh, uh, other violent acts that could re-traumatize them. And so making sure that they are able to function efficiently and effectively in their role as a violence interrupter or outreach worker is really important. But most importantly, we want to make sure they have the support that they need to uh, stay out of prison. So giving them, you know, a good livable wage and giving them the support they need to function properly in their job can really help them um, uh, stay out of uh, the criminal legal system. Yeah, I think the, uh, being a violence interrupter with you guys would seem like a, an amazing job getting out of a uh, prison or so, because it not only provides maybe, uh, you know, financial stability, but it also provides a sense of purpose, you know, that you matter, you value, that you're, you're valuable to society, and then you automatically take on a entirely opposite um, different, um, uh, different brand for yourself. You know, you're no longer a criminal. You're now almost on the the superhero side, which I, I, I think is, um, uh, I think is great. And it helps reduce the recidivism rate, you know, um, because the criminal justice, one of the, um, theories that's always intriguing was the self-looking glass theory by Cooley, which is, you know, you view yourself, how other people view you and, if you're in prison, everyone views you as a criminal and you're going to then view yourself as a criminal. But then when you get out and you have that sense of purpose, you're helping people, people start treating you in that same light. And I, I, I think that's, um, I think that's great. And, you know, treating, um, you know, treating violence like a disease, you know, where, for example, you know, actual diseases where it come from, uh, you know, during wintertime, everyone knows it's, it's cold season. So they, they take those preemptive steps to wash their hands, avoid touching their face, you know, probably now even starting to wear a mask. Um, do you guys, do you guys plan on something similar where it's, it's like, all right, it's summertime, it's July 4th weekend, or it's Labor Day weekend, and you're just expecting this sort of wave of violence? You know, what are some um, preemptive measures you guys take on uh, for these dates? And I guess, I guess what I'm really asking is, um, you know, is violence as seasonal as, you know, like disease, like, you know, getting a cold or being sick or, or ill? Is it, is there a seasonal approach to it as well? Or is it just kind of like an all year round thing? So I think different, we see peaks in different types of violence at different times. So we typically will see, you know, an uptick in firearm related violence in the spring, summer months, um, and then um, uh, uh, non-firearm related violence, typically in the fall and winter months. But what we're seeing is that that's really changing with the amount of uh, firearms that are out on, on the streets today, we're seeing it year round. And so we um, have to be proactive year round. And so a couple of things that we do, particularly around um, days of interest, so days where people are going to gather, uh, we will issue guidance using our social media platform or even issue a press release in, uh, giving people um, tips on how they can remain safe, you know, whether they're going to a July 4th parade, if they're going to a Thanksgiving Day parade or any other large gathering, um, their safety is really important. So there's some simple steps that individuals usually can take um, to remain safe during those times. Um, but more importantly, it's really, um, we really focus on making sure that we issue uh, keep, uh, public education year round. So people um, will, will keep their safety at top of mind, uh, regardless of the season, regardless of the, the special, whether there's a special day of interest um, uh, approaching or not. Um, because what we've, what we've seen is that the, the level of violence has really been unpredictable. What we, but what we are really concerned about is that it's increasing um, across, the, across the US. Um, and luckily, we know we've been able to prove that uh, this approach actually works. So during the middle of the pandemic, so I was responsible for implementing the cure violence model in St. Louis. And what we saw was a 26% reduction in homicides uh, during the most difficult period of the COVID-19 pandemic. And that was something that wasn't necessarily seen in other jurisdictions across the world, but we were really adamant about making sure we followed the model, 
um, to, uh, according to the fidelity that was created, um, and we saw the results. And so we are really um, encouraging uh, jurisdictions across the across the United States and across the world to to really think seriously about um, uh, implementing um, an evidence based public health approach uh, to really address violence in a more sustainable way. Because you know we we're we're the trajectory that the United States is on right now as it relates to violence is not a good one. Um, but there are tools and there are solutions um, that can be implemented to help curve um, curve violence in, in our country. Yeah, it definitely seems since COVID, um, there's been a, uh, not only an uptick, but like, almost, I don't want to say acceptance of it either, but it kind of starts to, to have that sense that there's not like this overall grand sense of urgency, you know, when, when something happens, it's just kind of like the, you know, you're getting off the New York City subway, you see a homeless person, you just like, you kind of keep it moving, you know, um, which is, which is kind of sad. What are, what are um, some, some misconceptions that you see from, from your level um, about how the average person or, or society, you know, sees violence? Cause you're seeing it from an evidence-based approach um, based off of not a combination of experiences and stats and working closely with your violence interrupters. What, what are some common misconceptions you think people have just from, you know, everyday life? I think the, biz, the biggest misconception that I've seen is that um, um, violence should be attributed, attributed to um, just certain types of people. Um, and so, and what that leads to is issues related to intersectionality, right? So you're targeting people of, um, based on, or treating people a certain way based on uh, the different demographic factors. Um, and so that has really disadvantaged our most vulnerable populations um, particularly because those individuals are um, had the highest exposure to violence. They're most likely just based on their exposure to commit acts of violence. But when you change their exposure, you change their likelihood of actually committing acts of violence because they're able to um, implement different behaviors to address the uh, stressors that they may be experiencing in life. And so um, getting people to, to, to change their thinking around um, violence as a um, people specific or population specific issue to really a public health issue is really important. So anyone who is um, disadvantaged in a way where they lose hope um, can be likely to to commit acts of violence. So re really working to engage uh, uh, stakeholders across the local public health system, as I mentioned before, is really critical. So um, uh, getting people to understand that it's not just a public safety issue or a public health issue, it's a public health and a public safety issue, um, but we also have to engage stakeholders, which includes um, the health systems, academic institutions, community-based organizations, and social support service organizations to lift this um, system of maltreatment for certain populations. And so we really have to band together across the system to undo the damage that has been caused. Yeah, because I think it's almost like like an attempt to try to ch change the environment, right? Because people being produced by their environment, um, you almost have to change the entire environment or change that person from the environment. And I think a more sustainable approach is changing the environment because then, you know, you can't pull everyone out of the, <laughs> pull everyone out of the same environment, you know? Right. Right. And I think, you know, really focusing on uh, health and social justice is really important here. Um, so I think, you know, there's, uh, in public health, you know, we use terminology um, such as uh, health equity and in those terms, but we really need to think about um, uh, violence prevention in the form of, as a form of social justice, meaning that not only are we giving people, connecting people to the resources that they need, but we're actively breaking down the barriers that prevent them from being able to access those resources in a meaningful and efficient way. And so when we look at the way the system has, has, has functioned, even today, for example, if you think about um, um, some of the struggles you may have as an individual just seeking medical care. Uh, and if you have insurance, that can still be really difficult uh, to get into a provider's office, especially if you have a special need. Um, and so imagine someone who is being uh, disenfranchised by society, ostracized by society, um, stigmatized by society, um, not given a fair chance, and we're expecting them to just fit the mold that we've created as a system, which doesn't support them, that is not, that's not fair. And so we really need to really uh, do a better job of really looking at violence prevention as a form of health and social justice um, to really um, uh, move the needle in the right direction. 
Yeah, yeah, sort of. Um, I think there's also a, a a mental health approach too, starting to you know gain a little uh, momentum where you know p- people are starting to look at things from like a psychological perspective first, and then a you know a, a physical perspective second, to where even you know you you get stressed out, and you know, a lot of times you have high blood pressure, which affects um, other parts of your body because something is going on you know upstairs there. Right. And, you know, mental health is really important as well. So when you think about the, again, the communities that are disproportionately impacted by, mm-hmm. by violence, so there's a level of toxic stress that individuals are carrying around them on the a stigma. daily basis. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so being, having to wonder if you're going to make it back from make it back home just after going to um, trying to get groceries or trying to run um, uh, uh, act, run, run errands to, you know, meet your, your, your daily activities, to conduct your daily activities. That's really um, that's really troubling uh, to really think about that. And so in that, ma- and the toxic stress manifests itself as uh, mental health issues also manifests itself as, you know, um, other chronic illnesses that we report on e- um, every day. So hypertension, um, anxiety, other mental health issues that people are struggling with. And so again, changing the environment of those communities does a world of good and the return on the investment is greater than anything that we can put a price tag on. Yeah, no, it, um, it definitely is because I mean, when you you pull somebody out of that, I mean, a lot of times when people go to go to go away to college or maybe they join the military, a lot of times they end up coming back such a changed person because they're no longer in that um, in that environment anymore that they've been, you know, their their entire life's and entire life, and that's all that they've known. So now they're finally given that chance to to change because they're they're out of it finally. Um, I uh, you know. One one example that I um, l- looked up on, which I, I I thought was was great in terms of also your your mentorship that you guys offer too, was the story about Kavine uh, Kavine Brown in Jacksonville, Florida, where you know he was a, a teenager and his uncle, who was his mentor at the time, because uh, his father was away at prison and he had a one year old at the time. Um, his uncle ended up getting shot and killed. So this is a gentleman who's a teenager with a one year old son. His father's in jail. His uncle, who's a mentor, just got shot and killed. And this this leaves him with what? You know, he's already living in a in a bad neighborhood. And your mentorship program, you know, ended up being able to support him, you know, not only mentally, but also with uh, the approach. Like for the first time in his life, it sounded like he was actually writing down goals. OK, this is what I wh- this is where I want to be in X amount of time. It's like, OK, well, then how do you get there? What is step one, step two, step three, just like the scientific method almost. And I could tell, I could tell it was working just from listening to him because it wasn't even like the words he was speaking. It was the authenticity of his voice, the confidence he had. And there's also a relaxed side to him when he was, um, you know, speaking with your team that, you know, somebody who speaks that way is very confident in, in the future for themselves. And, Sounded like the very first time he started thinking about that. And I think the more he was even speaking with the interviewer, <laughs> the better he was feeling because he's like, oh, man, I've, I've come a come a long way. And in his case, too, he ended with, you know, he's pursuing real estate and wants to um, get into or he's in real estate school now and he's trying to um, become a real estate agent or possibly. And I thought this was the best part, possibly become a sea merchant. And I was like, definitely two different ends of the spectrum. But I love that because who from who coming from a rough neighborhood would ever consider a sea merchant? Who who even knows what a sea merchant is? I I, I had to Google actually myself what you know what a, a sea merchant was, but I thought that that was great that that was on his mind because he, you know, didn't get out of his environment physically, but somebody came in who changed his environment mentally from your team was able to give a different perspective. And I thought, you know, how it's so um, resource demand, um, demanding though, with, you know, pairing somebody with, with, with a mentor, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it is, but I was like, that is the way that is the way, because he's, that is the most, and what to go off of what you said before of, targeting people who are most at risk and he kavan was such high risk mentor just got shot and killed so now he opens himself up to you know being retaliatory and father's already in prison and he's got a one-year-old that he has to support 
I mean, you couldn't get more of a, a higher risk individual than that. And it sounds like it sounds like it's it's working. I uh, you know I hope uh, you guys can follow up with him or you know in a couple of years and see where he is because I'd I'd love to see the um, the progression on that. Yeah, so um, hiring credible messengers is really important. So we really um, um, are adamant about making sure that we do our very best at the beginning of the process to make sure people are properly vetted to ensure that they have credibility in the communities. You know, if we hire people who are not credible, um, we're not we won't be able to achieve. Uh, those types of outcomes. And then not only that, but if if people aren't credible and they're going into these communities, um, they're putting their life at risk. And so they're likely to get yeah. killed trying to do the work while they engage individuals who are high, uh, highest risk, right? And so um, uh, hiring credible messengers who are dedicated to improving outcomes in, their, in the community is really important. And that's a key in making sure the program, uh, and that's a key component of the uh, of any successful program is having the right people who are on the front lines uh, being the messenger uh, in community. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's probably the most important thing too, because you don't want somebody who's still kind of maybe involved in in, in um, you know any criminal activity still kind of you know being the the preachers of of your message. Because um, I'm sure too, like y y they do have to, you do have to have some confidence that they've completely changed their approach on what they what they know because i mean if you're growing up in in a rough neighborhood so you end up going to jail or prison for a, a short amount of time you you kind of that's all you really know at the end of the day is just um you know crime getting by survival and you kind of have to have that realization which hopefully is through some some prison programs or through some mentorships that you know maybe we end up finding out better information on how to live my life, kind of like Kavan um, did. Um, Cause it kind of, it, it, it brings up, um, I'm become a big fan of, of history. And um, I, there was one little story that um, I discovered, which I love, I love history because it, there's some sort of similarity. If you look at any organization or any country or any civilization back in the day from prehistoric times till now that, have already experienced what we are experiencing right now, you know? So we kind of look back and go, okay, what are the approaches? What did, what worked for them and what didn't work for them? And, you know, going way back into the late 1500s into ancient Japan, Toyotimo, um, Toyotami, excuse me, Hideyoshi was considered to be one of the three great unifiers in Japan's history, which extended back to prehistoric times. And he was the emperor in the late 1500s. And he ended what was called the Sengoku period, which was just absolute complete civil war. It was 150 years of violent atrocities. And he finally ended it as emperor, which, of course, came along with um, the people who felt similar as him, unifying them with him, and then also destroying his enemies for sure. But at that time, when the Sengoku period ended, the entire country was at peace finally with, with each other. So everyone, there's no more civil war. There's no more violent atrocities. And in your experience with people being products of their environment, because this lasted 150 years, which was generations of people where they're born into war and they die with war. In your experience with people being products of their environment, take a take a guess as to what Japan decided to do with all of that peace that they had just like viciously earned, if you can. I'm not as familiar with that story, but based on you know what we would do now, we have when, when you have more peace, you would just continue to invest in those communities, um, uh, placing yeah. resources in those communities and helping them uh, stay on that traje trajectory. Yes, they if they had your resources, they I hope they would have, but being products of their environment, they with that piece, they decided to go and invade China. <laughs> you know, and it's like you look back on it and you go, okay, they're they're ancient samurais. All they know is war. All they know is war. They're in that environment for 150 years as a country. So when they obtained peace, they didn't even know how to keep the peace. They didn't know. You know, it was like what the, the cat didn't know what to do with the mouse when it caught it. They just they had no idea. They finally reached that step. And then they go and try to invade China, which to invade China, you have to invade Korea first. Um, so they invaded Korea. But, uh, you know, and then obviously things just fell right back apart. They went right back into 
um, just a, a complete mess. And, you know, looking back, there's there's so many examples in, in, in history of doing that, too, which is it's so great that we've kind of come such a long way to be able to implement these, you know, social policies and and treat things scientifically to where if if X happens, you already have you already have the formula already in place. I think, you know, you bring up a really important point, though. So um, similar to what they did, you know, establishing peace within their jurisdiction, right? That's one thing. But then you have to be mindful of the political nature of society, right? And so we're actually seeing that manifest in the United States where you have, you know, some areas of that are more peaceful than others. But then you look at what's happening on the political scene. Um, there's chaos everywhere because of, you know, um, uh, different political political exposures like the the rhetoric that's being um shared in different uh in different yeah. communities and that's creating a whole nother set of uh violence uh, related issues right and so being mindful of the different manifestations of violence is also really important so i think you know we get accustomed to talking about uh firearm related violence but there's so many other types of uh, manifestations of violence so you have gender-based violence you have um, uh, femicide, sex trafficking, uh, and then now, you know, over the last few years, political violence has really come to yeah. the forefront uh, in the United States. And these are all manifestations um, due to exposures that have occurred over time. Yeah, it's 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 getting I'm not going to lie. I mean, it's 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 getting a little bad out there, especially with the political violence, too, because they say the most dangerous you know, in terms of tiers um, of violence, I think political violence is second to um, violent acts committed with religious pur purposes, I think is number one. But right now, I mean, I, I mean, I feel like people, politics right now has become a religion for some people too. So I think you can actually throw that right on top as being just as bad, just as um, the atrocity can be just just as extreme as 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 anything. I mean, where you, you start to have it to throw in the word terrorism around there, too, because of the the mass scale that this is taking off on. Um, I wanted to get your your um, your, your thoughts on this where. Um, I know you guys are in, in a lot of different states all over the country and also, you know, you, you guys are globally, too, where, you know, you're in. Uh, you know, Atlanta, Baltimore, Charlotte, um, Greensboro, Kansas City, I can go on and on and on. I probably just name almost every city in the US. So <laughs> we'll skip that. Um, do your um, do you guys look at your statistics and choose a city on which ones you guys want to work in? Or do you guys have the or do you guys just have cities reach out to you or neighborhoods reach out to you or countries reach out to you and go, hey, can we get your um Get your thoughts on this. What's the best way of an of an approach, um, and and help them from there, or do you guys kind of um, choose where? Yeah, so we we um, typically we do not uh, solicit um, uh, different jurisdictions. So uh, what the process the way the process works for us is, you know, when an organization or a jurisdiction is ready, uh, someone from the local government or even a community based organization will reach out to Cure Violence Global even through through our website or through one of our staff. Um, and we'll start discussions with them about what the model entails and what our requirements are um, uh, in order for us to actually come to their jurisdiction and work with them to implement the program. Um, and so that's how it typically works. So we, again, not, we don't go out and uh, uh, handpick different jurisdictions because yeah. um, what we know is violence is an issue everywhere. I was gonna ask you one, one question that uh, I think is an interesting perspective to it determines whether it's you know long term short short term i'm sure it's kind of maybe in between on this but if you guys had unlimited funding right now like right now you get you know trillion dollars you guys can are able to use do you think that violence is something that can be solved overnight you know because a lot of times we think okay if we can get people in a good financial situation um if we can get them out of the environment or or um, update the environment, get the environment, make, make it a better environment or get more police officers or more violence interrupters. Um, do you think that it is something that can be solved overnight with, if you had unlimited funding? Yeah, so um, one of the things that we have to be mindful of is that we cannot buy ourselves out of this situation, right? So we have to be mindful of the um, level of, a, of disinvestment that has occurred over time and the types of exposures that have occurred 
in these communities where, you know, that are disproportionately impacted by violence. And so um, in addition to having the funding that's needed to implement as the types of resources that need to be invested uh, uh, and planted in those communities as well. And that's something that you can't just with fund. You have to have the right stakeholders at the table. You have to have the uh, right messengers in the community. There's a lot of things that have to come together across the system to really make um, to make the the uh, a meaningful and lasting impact. So funding alone isn't isn't the solution. Mm, yeah, that's right, too, because you have to have the right people involved. You know, you Absolutely. can't. I, yeah, because taking into account, too, you can't just, you know, reach out to everyone who just just got out of prison or jail and be like, hey, come be, you know, mentors and, and violence interrupters, because you still have to go through that that phase too. that that, that makes sense. How how can people help for people listening right now? Um, how can people get involved if they want to? Is it through donations? Is it through volunteering? Um, and also, where can people find you guys if they want to learn more? Because your website is amazing. You have a lot of great YouTube videos. You have a lot of great um, analysis, you have a lot of stats, experience-based stuff. And if you're a criminal justice major in college, sociology, psychology, or just want to learn more about violence from more of a bird's eye view approach, I so suggest going to the Cure Violence Global's website. Um, but where else, where else would people be able to, to find you guys to be able to help? Okay, so for individuals who want additional information, we encourage you to go to www.cvg.org um, to get more information. If you're interested in learning more about um, more uh, details about the work that we do, feel free to submit an inquiry on our website as well. Um, we are adamant about making sure we issue a timely response to individuals who desire additional information. And the other thing that people can do is you know, at your local level, if you're elected officials or uh, public safety division or public health departments are not implementing an evidence-based approach to reducing gun violence, we encourage you to really start having discussions with them as well. And the other thing you can do is vote. So utilize your power as a, as a member of society to vote for individuals who are prioritizing um, uh, public health or evidence-based approaches uh, to reducing violence in a sustainable way. Um, that's really uh, an important tool that you have in your arsenal that oftentimes goes unutilized in jurisdictions across the world. Yeah, definitely. I mean, especially even just talking to people in your community, having those kitchen table talks of, you know, what's happening and, and what's going on. Um, right. And I think so that's another important point, too. So a lot of times families don't have those discussions at home. So one of the things that parents can start doing is having discussions about uh, what violence means in their community and in, in the larger context of just living life. Um, that's something that um, uh, is really important, especially if you have children or youth in your home, that they understand what's happening and not just what's happening right now, but how the um, years and years of uh, certain activities um, have led us to this point where we're seeing um, uh, significant increases in all types of violence across the United States. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. And it's important stuff too, because I mean, violence, just like a disease, it can, it can take over, you know, it, it can take over. However, we want to control it. Um, Absolutely. and Dr. Dr. Eccles, I, I appreciate your time so much and guys, please, please check them out. If you want to get actual evidence to why crimes are committed and the science to stopping them with a bird's eye view approach, turn off the news, check out Cure Violence Global, um, because it, it really it, the thing is, you guys make things make sense. You know what I'm saying? That That's the I think the, the difference between, uh, you know, what you guys do and like media outlets who talk about violence and everything is that you guys actually make things make sense as to why things are are committed because it's it's you know science based um so uh dr Eccles, i'm i'm sure i'll i'll see you down the road somehow um and uh and thanks for coming on thank you so much for having me it was a pleasure With every star.